funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Monday, Labor Day. I'm Brianna Venosi. It's been a tough summer for travelers, a season defined by mass airline cancellations and delays, record high gas prices, and the demand for travel back at pre-pandemic levels. AAA says about one third of Americans planned to travel for the Labor Day weekend. The agency estimates tens of millions did so by hitting the roads, with numbers that'll rival Memorial Day and July 4th weekends. Despite the surge in demand to get out and about, this weekend's travel appeared to be far smoother than those early holidays, much to the surprise and pleasure of those taking trips. Experts say it's the result of airline carriers and federal transportation leaders taking stock in lessons learned during the havoc at the height of the summer. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas was at Newark Airport today to see how passengers were faring. My flight was amazing, actually. There was no delays. That seemed to be the resounding feeling for most travelers coming through Newark Airport on this Labor Day, even as the number of those traveling this weekend is almost back to pre-pandemic levels, according to the TSA. We're headed to Toronto, where we live, and uh, looks good so far. It says it's on time and no traffic getting here, so. I'm sure with kids, you leave extra time for travel anyway. Did you leave more because of the holiday weekend? Yeah, usually we're the type that comes right at the right time, but we did leave extra because, yeah, Labor Day. <laughs> Maybe too much time in hindsight because lines were short and walkways were clear. A far cry from the hustle and bustle caused by delays and cancellations over the last several holiday weekends. And that's strategic, says travel analyst Henry Hardevelt. The airlines, I think, realized by, uh, uh, after July 4th that they were still overextending themselves. When travel demand surged, the airlines thought, oh, okay, we can handle this. They learned very quickly they couldn't. It was a painful, expensive, and embarrassing lesson. So this August, many began scaling back the number of flights they're operating daily. By reducing flights, they've got more of a buffer to keep flights on time uh, and operating. It might feel like smooth sailing so far here today, but pilots are fed up with some of the issues they've been dealing with over the last several months. On Thursday, off-duty pilots picketed at 12 different airports across the U.S., demanding that management fix some of the operational problems that have been plaguing their airlines. While the larger airlines, such as United, have been successful in recruiting more pilots, uh, the regional airlines, which operate the 50 to 76 seat airplanes that fly the shorter routes have been struggling to hire. They've raised their pay rates. They're doing a lot more to hire and keep pilots, but it's a struggle for them. And so when we look at the data, we see more of these regional flights being canceled proportionately than the mainline uh, airline flights. Hardevelt says those major airlines have been gradually ramping up their staff because personnel shortages were another major contributor to early summer delays. They could be the reason why this Jersey traveler made it home on time, but landed in the wrong place. When we landed, they said that we need to be pulled in by the trolley, and they hooked us up to the trolley, pulled us to a different terminal. Now we're at a different baggage claim. Not really sure what's going on, but we're waiting for our bags. And those staffing shortages this summer left travelers like Atlanta resident Jody Garcia prepared for the worst this weekend. When you travel out of Atlanta, you automatically give yourself a couple of hours, just maybe three, just to be on the safe side. The TSA lines can be long. Uh, Sometimes you get to the airport, I've been to the airport, it was bumper to bumper just to get to the gate, so. But that's not what you're seeing today? Not here, no, we drove right up and we got dropped off and, and we're gonna find out about the flight in a little while, hopefully it'll still, still be there. Lara Fernandez was also on that Atlanta flight that was on time, she was not. We arrived late actually, so we're running late right now, but it says we're on time, we haven't started boarding. So we're hoping that you all have a smooth TSA transition, different from Atlanta, because sometimes 
coming out, we had to wait about 30 minutes to get through TSA. Moral of the story, never assume the airlines are the ones running behind. Hardeveld has some more advice for any travelers planning future trips, considering that airlines will continue to scale back the number of flights they're offering. If you're thinking about taking a trip, I would encourage you to start shopping for flights now. And don't try to game the system. If you find flights and fares that meet your needs, book them because on most airlines with most fares, if you find a lower fare, you can cancel your original reservation, get that, that fare back as a credit, rebook at the lower fare, and then you have that additional credit to use for another trip. And be prepared to be flexible on your travel dates. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Well, it's not Labor Day without the official South Plainfield Parade. It's one of New Jersey's oldest and best attended Labor Day traditions. Thousands lined the streets this year to watch the procession of veterans groups and first responders, Boy Scouts and high school sports teams, a procession of classic cars and marching bands. This year's theme was Parade Around the World with floats honoring the achievements of different cultures worldwide. It's it's also the spot for local, state, and even federal lawmakers to glad hand the public. Congressman Frank Pallone and State Senator Patrick Dignan joined this year's festivities, which culminates with music, food, and of course, fireworks. But the real history of Labor Day isn't about the barbecues and parades. The event dates back to the 1800s when New Jersey's own President Grover Cleveland signed a bill declaring it a national holiday, honoring the work of labor activists who fought for a federal holiday to recognize the contributions of American workers. Well, more than a century later, the U.S. is again in the midst of a labor movement. This time, though, while workers are finding it easier to unionize, they're still fighting for a seat at the bargaining table. Ted Goldberg reports. Shift supervisor Sarah Moogle and her co-workers at the Hopewell Starbucks voted to unionize four months ago. They still haven't begun to negotiate a labor contract with corporate. We've been asking numerous times to start bargaining with this company, and every single time we've been ignored. They're not coming to the bargaining table. Uh, we won our election despite all their union busting, and it's not legal for them to not bargain with us in fair, in a good faith. The Hopewell store was New Jersey's first to organize. A Starbucks in Montclair followed their lead and voted to unionize just two weeks ago. Employees there say Starbucks is starting to retaliate. It was very overt how like inflexible they were trying to be this this uh what was at the end of the summer a lot of our employees were rejected their schedules for school barista james cruz says the church street store was understaffed even before its vote to unionize he says corporate has allowed the problem to get worse you're there they're trying to really tighten yeah, like tighten around the uh, amount of work that all of us are doing so they can see if they can get rid of a lot of the main leaders in the union or just make things a little bit more inhospitable. More than 200 American Starbucks stores have voted to unionize, but none of them have agreed to a labor contract. Moogle says Starbucks has fought the unions every step of the way. She says Starbucks is now offering better health care for stores that haven't organized which led to a complaint to the National Labor Relations Board. They were saying that they couldn't do it without bargaining with us since we're unionized, but we had sent in a legal notice with our bargaining demands that said that we waived the right over bargaining over those benefits specifically. Um, it went to the NLRB. The NLRB ruled that them not giving us those benefits was illegal. These stores are part of a busy summer for organized labor. This summer was uh, for labor was a union strong. Well, it's been a hot labor summer, as the saying goes. A hot labor summer that saw a spike in union drives, according to a recent report by the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. The second quarter of this year saw 685 union drives nationwide, nearly a 50% increase from the previous quarter. Labor experts say it will take some time for that to translate to a meaningful increase and how many workers are part of a union. We have to get from winning elections to actually negotiating contracts and union uh, members actually paying dues and going into the union roster. We have a long way to go to see that change. That's why the numbers 
uh, are not increasing right away. We're just seeing a lot of uh, unionization efforts in smaller employers. Um, when unions grew, you know, historically in the U.S. back in the 30s and 40s, you had giant, you know, like GM factories organizing with thousands and thousands of employees joining the labor movement all at once. A Starbucks spokesperson says the company, quote, categorically denies making punitive scheduling changes or taking any other anti-union actions at New Jersey locations. As more of their stores organize and labor contracts go unnegotiated, more strikes are likely to follow. The Hopewell Starbucks staged one a month ago. Our last strike was very last minute. Uh, we didn't need a lot of time to plan it because at the end of the day, it's just workers deciding that like this is the point where we've had enough, so we're going on strike. So that's something we can do at any point. That's one tactic in the union arsenal and a threat that workers hope will bring Starbucks to the bargaining table to hammer out a deal. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. Well, Governor Murphy says his administration will soon begin a review of how the state responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a vow he made roughly two years ago, just after the virus began rapidly spreading through the state. The renewed promise came during an interview on Fox News Sunday, in which the governor also played coy while dispelling rumors over whether he'll run for president in 2024. Murphy said he'd have President Biden's back if he seeks re-election and said he hasn't met with donors about his own potential bid if Biden decides not to run. Earlier this year, President Biden faced calls from members within his party to not seek another White House term, but he's recently been enjoying more support for re-election from Democrats. I've said this publicly and I said it to the president privately. He says he's running. Uh, I take him on his word. Assuming he does run, he'll have no bigger backer than yours truly. Uh, and I think that's really the base case right now. And in the meantime, I'm going to have my nose pressed against the Jersey glass and hopefully, whether it's through the NGA or the DGA, pick up some good playbooks from other states and other places in the nation and try to give a Jersey flavor to them and, and, and again, keep moving forward. At the height of the pandemic, New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness launched a new weapon in its fight against misinformation and manufactured news, a disinformation portal that officials say has become crucial in combating everything from deep fake technology to altered viral videos and conspiracy theories. I recently spoke with Thomas Hauk, a retired FBI agent who runs the portal for New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security about how his team is getting reliable information out to the public as it works to eliminate false facts. Thomas, I'm thinking back to the early days of the pandemic when this portal was launched. There were a number of conspiracy theories uh, that you all were looking to debunk. What types of disinformation um, has the portal received and attempted to dispel? Yeah, so you, you, hit, you hit on the... Uh... COVID pandemic, that was actually um, back in two, 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic, that's when we stood up the portal. And that was in response to disinformation on social media and the internet related to COVID. Um, more recent topics we've covered, uh, we've tried to address the 2020 election, uh, the war in Ukraine, as well as the current monkeypox outbreak. What's been the most concerning? We take particular interest in disinformation that contains threats a call to action, incites violence, or has a nexus to terrorism. And we ask that anybody who may see those types, uh, that type of information, that they would contact our counterterrorism watch desk. Um, if I could give the number, 1-866-4-SAFE-NJ, 1-866-4-SAFE-NJ, or our tip line, or our website for tips, which is tips at njohsp.gov. Is it still primarily being spread, the disinformation, on social media platforms? And are we still seeing a rise in it? Well, I think we are seeing a rise. And while disinformation can and is seen on more traditional communications like flyers or word of mouth, um, our analysts at NJOSP are primarily focused on social media platforms, chat rooms, and the Internet in general. And the reason for that is that technology provides an avenue to spread disinformation farther and faster than ever before. So th our focus is on, on those, those means to spread disinformation. How do you all identify disinformation for folks so that they can do some of the work for you? Sure. So 
our analysis bureau, they're looking for informa misinformation and disinformation that has the potential to incite panic, increase polarization, influence government actions or law enforcement responses, and otherwise exhaust res resources. And a big one is that information that, or disinformation that creates distrust between the government and the people. Um, one of the things we did this past spring was we revamped our disinformation page and we now provide the public with tools, in this case, the form of a checklist that could assist them in independently vetting information. Well, I wonder, I mean, you mentioned distrust with the government. I wonder if a government run portal like this um, is the best way to go about it since the government essentially is what folks are questioning. We encourage folks to do, do their own due diligence. And not only do we encourage them to do that, I talked about the checklist we give them so they can do that effectively. And you know, if we're doing a good job, they're gonna come, come to the same conclusions we do. And I think another thing that would um, play a big role in, in earning trust is, you know, on a rare occasion, if we, we missed the mark or we got something wrong, we have to own it, take responsibility for it, and most importantly, be extremely timely sure. in getting the accurate information out there. Right, which correct. we know has happened certainly at the federal level. Uh, Thomas Hauck with the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome, thank you, Brianna. In our Spotlight on Business segment tonight, it's going to cost you more to earn a degree at just about all of the state's four-year college campuses. According to a report by NJ Advance Media, tuition and fees are increasing at 25 of New Jersey's 27 colleges by about 3 percent on average. Stevens Institute of Technology is now the most expensive in the state, with a price tag of more than $58,000 a year. Princeton University was second on the list at just under 58,000 annually. Now those numbers don't include room, board and books, which can add another $10,000 to the total bill. The state's least expensive four-year school, according to the report, is Kane University in Union County. Annual tuition and fees there run nearly $13,000. Higher education leaders say rising inflation rates made budget setting difficult. Only St. Elizabeth University and Bloomfield College, both small private universities, kept tuition rates flat for the year. Support for the business report provided by the Chamber of Commerce Southern New Jersey working for economic prosperity by uniting business and community leaders for more than 150 years. Membership and event information online at chambersnj.com. With college classes back in session, K through 12 students are also returning to school this week, and parents have a lot on their minds. The shift away from pandemic era restrictions, the rise in mass shootings, bringing school security again into the concerns, and new curriculum that sparked controversy and even protests, creating anxiety for some. Melissa Rose Cooper spoke with families as they prepare for the new school year and the issues at the top of their worries. The unofficial start of fall is here, and that means kids around New Jersey are gearing up to head back to class. I'm really excited to go back to school because summer has slowed down. Veda Maliala is starting eighth grade, and after facing a number of learning challenges in the last two years because of the pandemic, her father is also excited to see her go back as long as she is safe. I know that we've become a little bit complacent as far as COVID is concerned, and uh, you know we see the cases rising, but you know I, I just hope that uh, you know that they're gonna take that into consideration. Uh, I, I think that it's been hard on, on the kids for the last two years. A hardship that also highlighted the significance of making sure mental health services are available for children. There's always been need, but the pandemic absolutely made it more essential, right? because of the the isolation that students, that all people felt really, but our students felt during the pandemic um, and the lockdowns that we had to do in online schooling um, really brought a lot more to the forefront, right? And we can't ignore that. We need to help our kids, you know, get better and get back to, um, I, I'm a resident to say normal, but back to, you know, being able to connect with others and feel healthy and secure about themselves. Because going out of the pandemic, you'd, you'd think that a lot of people would, would expect that now we're out of the pandemic. So 
going to be a lot easier on us and the mental health levels should be going back up. But that's not the case. High school senior Adnan Al-Khalili has had his own struggles with mental health. After getting therapy to help him with his feelings, he created Free the Bird so he could help other kids get the help they need. What I found through my own observation is that the solution is talking about your mental health. Hence the name Free the Bird because when, I, when you talk about your mental health, it's like freeing yourself from a cage. So what we really need for youth and students especially is to start the conversation around mental health and get more people talking about it with each other, with their peers, um, with their teachers, you know, as a school, as a whole, as a whole community. With the recent mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, making sure students know what to do in the event of an emergency is also key to keeping them safe. That's why Habiba Johnson Hafiz is relieved to know schools are stepping up security. Our school here in Jersey City held a lot of uh, fire drills, um, active shooter drills, all sorts of safety protocols that are in place at their public school that they go to. She is, however, a little disappointed that her four children will no longer have access to free meals at school, something she says has been a big help with the rise of inflation. Four children and breakfast is, I think, around $2 and lunch is around $3, so $5 a day times four, you know, that adds up over the cost, over the, the length of the entire school year. So hopefully, you know, that's just something that, um, that you know, can, can be looked at um, with the legislator in New Jersey, and that's a bill that can be passed. And, you know, the students can, our, our students can, can go back to having access to, um, to those lunches, um, like I said, so that that way we can save money and use it towards other things. So as kids pack up their backpacks for the first day of school, even though COVID fears have lessened, it seems there are still plenty of classroom concerns for parents to worry about. Parents being parents. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Well, this school year will look a bit different than the last two years with the shift away from most of the COVID prevention guidelines that dominated schools during the pandemic. As vaccines are more readily available and COVID cases are on the decline, there will be no more mandatory testing or mask wearing. Quarantining entire classrooms, that's over too. Education writer John Mooney joins me to talk about what teachers and students can expect when the doors open tomorrow. John, uh, thanks for joining us on this Labor Day. So with the exception of Newark, where masks will still be required, school's gonna look a whole lot different. Yeah, I mean, this is after a couple of false starts. Um, this may be indeed the fall uh, where schools return to normal, at least in terms of uh, the pandemic. Um, I talked to a superintendent this morning and, and he sent out a letter to his parents and didn't even mention COVID. Uh, and, and he said that wow. was nice uh, not to have to do for the first time in two years. Uh, so, you know, pending something uncertain, it, it does look like a year that's going to, you know, at least be away from, from requirements on it. Doesn't mean we're not going to be thinking about it. And as you mentioned, Newark is um, indeed starting the year with a, a mask mandate for students. Uh, but the state put out some guidance last week on Friday, I think, uh, that said that they are really moving to what they called a routine disease control model, yeah. uh, as opposed to uh, tracking every single case. They're looking for clusters, but there will not be requirements, as you said, on in terms of testing and in terms of quarantining and the like, uh, unless, of course, you test positive and then you do, you know, they're telling you to, to go home for five days, but but exposure and contact tracing, that seems like a thing of the past at this time. And how do educators and administrators feel about this? There were some push and pull, certainly with unions and, and teachers over the last two years of what exactly to do. Uh, and I think it may still be in play in Newark uh, and, and why we, we see them holding on to that mandate, at least for the time being. But by and large, I think teachers and, and administrators are really looking to get back to normal. I mean, this has been an incredible ride for them and, and an incredible amount of stress and, and work went into it. So I think they'll they'll take this opening and, and hope for the best. But certainly all signs are positive at the, at the moment. Where does remote learning stand now? I mean, is that still an option if those clusters do, in fact, happen? Oh, remember remote learning. Yeah. I mean, that was a big deal at the time. Uh, I think that's also been put to the side for better or worse. I think there were some good lessons there, but um, I think that there will be less of that certainly going forward. I think they're going to work as hard as possible to keep kids in class. Uh, there'll certainly be circumstances uh, where individual students need to go to remote learning. But I think the mantra is in-person learning right now, and, and I don't see that changing, certainly not in the short term. 
Uh, very quickly, John, it's definitely a victory, yes, for all the parents who protested, spoke out at, at school board meetings against a lot of these safety protocols? Well, yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, certainly there, there's going to be a lot of debate on whether these protocols did help uh, in the long run, but but parents are looking to get these kids back in the classroom. So, uh, sure, I think it's a victory for all parents if, if kids can uh, be back to learning as, as, at a level we want them to be. And we wish them a great school year. John Mooney, thanks for joining us today. Good to see you. And that's going to do it for us tonight. But make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and follow us on social media to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venosi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us on this Labor Day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor. And our homegrown champions. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM. We've got New Jersey covered.